Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Greenwood, and I'm the president and CEO of Bio. So uh, I've been wel welcoming people to these kinds of events for the last five days, and I'm glad to welcome you all here for this Scientific American uh, uh, Super Session, which is always one of the, uh, I think, most important ones. Let me start by recognizing Jeremy Abbott and Michael May from Scientific American for their partnership and leadership on this important project and Super Session. Bio is proud to partner with Scientific American on the Worldview Report for the eighth year. The report continues to get better each year with more in-depth analysis, strategic insights, and best practices from key markets around the globe. The 2016 Scientific American Worldview Report and Scorecard provides a comprehensive country-by-country -country analysis of biotechnology around the world. It gives readers a valuable snapshot of the global biotech industry today, and it offers policymakers a clear look at the policies and investments that are needed for our industry to grow and thrive in the years to come. The global reach of our work continues to expand. As an industry, we are creating new jobs and economic opportunities around the world while transforming the fields of medicine, energy, agriculture, and others. We do that by creating value, and we create value by developing breakthrough products that address serious human needs like fighting disease, hunger, and pollution. We create new innovations for improving global health and eradicating deadly diseases. We provide farmers in developing countries with biotech crops that improve yields and boost family incomes, and we're growing a bio-based economy supported by renewable fuels and renewable bioproducts. As a champion of the biotech industry, where am I? As champion of the biotech industry, Bio continues to expand our international reach by working with partners and sister associations worldwide and by hosting conferences and con convenings, conventions in key markets around the world. In the international policy arena, we advocate for strong intellectual property protection, for fair and transparent regulatory systems, and for other policies that enable the growth of a strong and vibrant biotechnology industry. I travel a great deal as CEO of Bio, and one of the questions I receive most from policymakers and government leaders around the world is, how do we grow and scale our biotechnology sector? How do we best support scientific research, entrepreneurial growth, and private investment? This issue of Scientific American serves as an important resource for achieving those goals. It is a must read for those in the public and private sector looking for the best thought leadership and writing on what it takes to succeed globally in our industry and how that success translates into a world where more people have access to the most innovative medicines, the most nutritious foods, and the types of products and energy sources that are better for our environment and more globally sustainable. I congratulate the team at Scientific American on bringing us another thorough, insightful, and impactful report. And I will add editorially that one of the things that I tell people when they ask how they can make a hub, whether they say, how can I make a hub in the state of New York, or how can I make a hub in some other country in the world, uh, it is that you have to get your health department and your commerce department to see the world through similar eyes, because usually what happens is the health ministries or the health departments who are paying for health care are busy trying to figure out how to get our products for nothing, while the commerce and economic development arms of the governments are trying to figure out how to create innovative industries, and you cannot have both of those things simultaneously. So that is my editorial comment, which I pretty much make wherever I go. Enjoy the super session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. I owe you an apology. When we first started this project, we first started doing Scientific American Worldview at Bio, we were so happy to be working with uh, the Bio organization. Jim made a few comments. I came up and I thanked him for being, hosting a great party for a few days, and I thanked him for being the grand poobah of this convention. But it didn't come out grand poobah. It came out granddad. And so uh, I want to say, Jim, thanks for being the grand poobah and being the young, virulent master of ceremonies here. Um, <laughs> What's that? Virulent. Virulent. Vir virile. Virile. 
I'll see you in eight years and I'll apologize again. Don't hit me. Welcome to the last Scientific American uh, Super Session. Jim, Jim was my family's congressman, the 8th District of Pennsylvania in Doylestown. I've got family there. They loved Jim. He was a thoughtful, respected, well-balanced politician. So I know he does great stuff with bio, but Jim, your country may need you. I said, you know, think about it. <laughs> so this is the last party. This is the last session. So we're going to have fun. We're going to, you know, be, be dynamic. There's going to be no PowerPoints, I promise you. I'm Jeremy Abbott. I'm the publisher of Scientific American Magazine. I'm the publisher and founder of Worldview. We're so thrilled to be tracking innovation globally. Biotechnology and, and, and bioinnovation is an important topic, not just to one country, but to all countries. The world is flat. Talent in one country goes to other countries. People collaborate across borders more than ever through technology. Mosquitoes do not know national boundaries. Our problems are global. The world is flat. So I think this is an ever important conversation, and we're so thrilled to be having it. I want to thank the editorial team of Worldview. Every year they put out an amazing magazine. If you haven't seen it, it's on your seat. You might be sitting on it. Give it a read. Mike May, our editorial director. Yali Freeman, our data analytics uh, chief, who leads up the scorecard. And this year we are so pleased to have in our presence our art director who makes Worldview beautiful every year Joelle Bolt. So thank you guys for the amazing work. I also, this year in Worldview, for the first time ever, we're exploring innovation, not just globally, but we decided to think about exploring it from a state level. And we did a, a story, actually a special section on New Jersey as a test case for how much control policymakers, industry has to support a local innovation region. And for that, we're thankful for BioNJ and Debbie Hart and her team for getting us in contact with some great people in, in that state. I finally want to thank the sponsors of Worldview who make this happen. Um, Merck KGA, Darmstadt, Germany, Covance, Celgene, GSK, Victoria State Government of Australia, and of course, our marquee sponsor this year, Johnson Johnson Innovation. And Without further ado, I'm going to introduce someone from that lovely organization, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. But I want to bring up uh, Seema Kumar from J&J, &J, VP of Communications and Global Health and Innovation. And she's going to start us off with a few words today. So take it away, Seema. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. So again, on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, I am so pleased that we are able to sponsor and be a marquee sponsor, actually, of this Scientific American Super Session and Worldview. So we have a longstanding collaboration with Scientific American and with Jeremy and with Mike May and uh, previously with John Rennie. And we've done a variety of things together and putting focus, actually, on raising topics of great importance, uh, including uh, STEM, including science journalism, including global health, innovation, public policy, science policy, etc. And we've always found it to be uh, an important venue, not just here, but in a variety of forums, to shed light on topics of great importance to society. So today's discussion, of course, the focus is on biotechnology in the age of convergence, and a focus on how do we create new innovative medicines, medical devices, consumer products, to make a positive impact on society. Now, of course, we believe that the next generation of innovations will come from the intersection of multiple disciplines, multiple geographies, talent from multiple different places, and diversity, diversity of ideas. And that will reshape the way healthcare is developed, delivered, managed, and experienced. 
We need these new innovations because we believe that many of the simple diseases have been solved. The low-hanging fruit is gone. And what we need to solve today are the big challenges, the big medical challenges, diseases like Alzheimer's disease, cancer, diabetes. And plus, we need to be prepared for emerging threats that have caught us by surprise, such as Ebola, Zika, antimicrobial resistance, and who knows what's to come in the months and years ahead. At Johnson & Johnson, you've heard me say this throughout this week, and others say this throughout the week, um, we believe that a great idea can come from anywhere in the world, and that the world is our laboratory. And so we need the best ideas to solve these kinds of challenges, regardless of the geography that it comes from or the discipline that it comes from. And we need to bring to them together to improve the health and well-being of people all over the world. So Johnson & Johnson Innovation, through our innovation strategy, our goal is to create an innovation ecosystem that will raise the tide of innovation all over, and that rising tide will float all boats. Through our own internal R&D across our three sectors, which is the pharmaceutical sector, medical devices sector, and the consumer sector, and through our external innovation, through our innovation centers, through our J-Labs incubators, through our JJDC venture arms, we provide scientists, entrepreneurs, and emerging companies from many disciplines with a one-stop access to our science and technology experts who in turn can facilitate collaborations across the pharmaceutical, medical device, and consumer sectors of Johnson & Johnson. And through such connections, our external partners and our internal innovators are working to create the healthcare ecosystem for the future. A couple more words. At J&J, you may have seen this if you visited the booth or if you've listened in on any of our sessions, including the session with Bill Hyde, our head of um, R&D for Pharma. We imagine a world without disease, and that will require not just disease treatments and precision medicines and early diagnostics, but also disease interception, primary and secondary prevention, and cures, of course. It is a very exciting future, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the panel has to say about it as we look into the crystal ball of what's to come. So let me now turn it back to Jeremy. And Jeremy, are you going to be introducing the panel? OK, you're going to be introducing David. So come on up, Jeremy. And, and thank you for not misspelling my name or my title. I didn't misspell anything, right? <laughs> I didn't call you virulent. So uh, we're going to be led by an amazing guy with an amazing panel discussing innovation, the ecosystem of innovation, the global dimensions of it. You know, it's a word that gets thrown around, and it's a word almost like health that it doesn't mean much until you put it next to other things. And I feel like what the mission of Worldview is is to make sure that innovation is serving the underserved. If we're not doing that right, what's the point? This is kind of a rubber meets the road exploration. And I could think of no better example that's emblematic of characterizing innovation that serves a purpose than something my wife said a few weeks ago. And she just said, why is Google working on a self-driving car and not self-folding laundry? And it was really, if it can't be in the service of a real need, what's the point? So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend and our host and moderator today. Um, David Brancaccio is the host and senior editor of American Public Media's Marketplace Morning Report, which I listen to religiously every morning. Um, I think it's the business program with the largest audience in the world. Do you want to check the facts on that? No? What? Fine. Um, David's work has earned him some of the highest awards in journalism, including the Peabody, the Columbia DuPont, the Walter Cronkite Award, and um, an Emmy, the Emmy, maybe multiple. So without further ado, our moderator today, my friend with the golden voice, David Brancaccio. Generous. You know, they say there are 35,000 meetings here at BIO 2016. 
How does it feel to have completed 34,999 of them? <laughs> You've done well, my dear friends. I have been working to solve what I think is one of your great problems. It's certainly one of mine. The problem is this. You've run into it, and I've been to a lot of sessions around here where this theme has come up either directly or indirectly. We humans have trouble with long-term thinking, right? To get a transformative result in the future, we have to take action now, but the future seems far off. This notion of investments that pay off later is often hard to get your head around. Companies too often focus on the next financial quarter or even this financial quarter. Institutions do the same thing. Governments, notorious for this. They worry about the budget cycle. They worry about the next election cycle. So in this election year in the US, I was interested in fostering a national conversation about things we need to do now to make the world better, the country better, in, say, 20 years, 50 years. I was inspired about how to prompt this conversation by one of our legendary literary figures here in the US, writer and social critic Kurt Vonnegut. I had the um, honor of doing the last long interview with Kurt Vonnegut before he passed away. I did it for public television. Vonnegut once wrote, Science is magic that works. And he had thought he was going to train to be a biochemist, I think it was, until the US Army had different ideas for him. And so I sat down and talked with Vonnegut about a range of things, especially about his concern that humans, that we humans have already wrecked the Earth. And he had this rhetorical image that he conjured. He thinks the Earth is going to generate antibodies to us and get rid of us for the assaults that we've made on the earth. Then he said the words that have become a bit of a meme online. I'm using it for the special coverage I'm about to tell you about. Um, he said in that interview 11 years ago, quote, no country has ever had a secretary of the future. And there are no plans, he said, at the US level for our children and our grandchildren. Now, I took that to mean what this country needs is a secretary of the future, a cabinet-level official who views policy with this very long telephoto lens. So my thought was, if the next president of the US were to appoint a secretary of the future, an interesting question is, what would that person's portfolio contain? So we've been doing some journalism to explore some issues. I've assigned my colleagues. But much more importantly, we've reached out to our audience our radio audience and digital to suggest, OK, if we had a secretary of the future, what would that person do? Um, when I asked one of the candidates for president about this, she's since dropped out, Carly Fiorina, formerly of HP. Uh, she was a little humorless about the whole thing and saw it as, um, I know, that's, I, I, what should I expect? But uh, she's a very serious executive. Uh, she saw it as another layer of bureaucracy and red tape. Oh, no, 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 that's not the point, is it? You could, you could get around that. But when I started posing this notion, at least even inside my own newsroom, people thought, oh, that's sort of interesting, but it seems a little fringe, a little not at the center of debate. But here's what we found right away. Maybe you know this already. Many publicly held corporations have secretaries of the future. They don't use that term. They call them chief sustainability officers. And if you immediately said, OK, so they worry about their uh, carbon footprint, yes, they do. But at some organizations, and we talk to a bunch, they see their remit as much wider than that. People looking out for existential threats to the company that will come somewhere in the future, uh, or even to their other stakeholders, which would include the Earth. And then one of my colleagues wonderfully found a sovereign nation, a country that has a cabinet level secretary of the future. I wonder what region it is, if you thought of that. It's got to be Scandinavia, right, somewhere? It's Sweden. They don't call it secretary of the future there. Uh, Christina Persson is Sweden's minister for strategic development. But when you take a look at what she's covering, it's very close to this idea. She said she hopes other nations, maybe even the next US president, 
might appoint one. Why? Because she's very lonely. There are no other secretaries of the future she can talk to. She said this to me on the air. Can you imagine what Jim Greenwood at Bio might say in his first meeting with the U.S. Secretary of the Future in the first week in Washington of the Michael Bloomberg administration? I don't even think it's possible anymore, is it? I don't think he could get on enough ballots. There'd be issues of energy, sustainability. There would be issues of education. In one of our Secretary of the Future pieces, we looked at the future of education in the US, and it's a very interesting idea in which everything you do, this conference, a little online course you took, a book you read would count toward a chit, an education chit, and you count all those up and you could put it on your resume. I have done this kind of training, my formal education, my informal education, but how would that be, well, how would it be accredited? Right? It could be, <laughs> just thinking of another candidate in a university, uh, that, I shouldn't bring that up. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that till this second at the podium. But there are some education chits that would be better than others and more valid. And so that might be a secretary of the future issue. Which brings me to a very interesting data set that many in this group might want to slip into this minister of the future's portfolio the data in the latest Scientific American Worldview scorecard, right? In this multimedia world, Jeremy mentioned it, but I was also struck looking at the, at the publication. Did you see the striking way in there that the data is displayed? Some really interesting uh, graphics communication, very 21st century going on, and it struck me that if we're back here for bio 2019 or bio 2020, you know that worldview is going to come with a free set of augmented reality glasses, right? We're going to put them on and we're going to walk through the scorecard like there'll be the, um, there'll be the IP protection, it'll be like a stalactite that we can see the size, and there'll be a stalagmite that'll be policy and stability, and in that way we'll be able to interpret this data. But that's where it's going, and I think this issue uh, gives us a taste of that. By the way, don't just look later on on the plane in the hotel at the, uh, at the magazine. Don't just look at the scorecard. The uh, rest of the magazine's got some really interesting stuff. I was struck by um, the New, Jer the New Jersey stuff that uh, Jeremy mentioned, how it's becoming a hub. I live in New Jersey, so I say this affectionately. I'm not sure of New Jersey's tagline for all of this. Biotech New Jersey, what's it to you? <laughs> um, kid, why did I even reinforce that? <laughs> New Jersey's actually gorgeous. I do more bike riding in New Jersey than I ever did when I lived in California. Um, but also in the Worldview Edition, just to call your attention to it, uh, interview with the nephew of President John F. Kennedy, Patrick Kennedy, former congressman, is in there. He is a co-founder of a very interesting um, nonprofit to cross-pollinate and aggregate brain research, which he says is sort of fragmented. And he has some interesting ideas, including some innovative funding models. He says, if we're at war with diseases of the brain, maybe we should have a war bond, a brain bond, to raise money. Thought that was quite interesting. I'm going to welcome up the panel in the order that the audio man made me. That's how it's going to work this time. So therefore, uh, it's, it's random. And we're going to fill in these seats. And so our first panelist, Dr. Jenny Ward Robinson, if I can welcome you to the stage and you can go to the far seat. She is president and CEO of the Pan American Health Organization, the PAHO Foundation. That's the international health agency focused on the Americas. It fosters technical cooperation with all the countries in its purview to fight communicable, uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases, to strengthen health systems and respond to emergencies. There she is. Wow. All right. Uh, now, according to this list, did I blow it already? I already blew it already in terms of the order. Um, Luke DeBrun, president of GSK, GlaxoSmithKline's global vaccines business. Talk about the cutting edge of everything. Luke. It's also welcome to the stage. 
<laughs> getting the order right, <laughs> the wonderful Naras Damrong Chai, who's CEO of T-Cells. T-C-L-E-S stands for the Thailand Center of Excellence for Life Sciences, a noted laboratory scientist himself, and a leading exponent of Thailand's special place in the life sciences. And then to round out this panel, I want to really welcome uh, a 25-year veteran of the pharmaceutical industry, Marianne De Becker, President Biz uh, Development Leader, Business Development Leader for the Global Infectious Diseases and Vaccines Therapeutic Area at aforementioned Johnson & Johnson, a scientist with an MBA. Look what happens. A skilled practitioner in the art of the deal, which is the art of partnership, which is going to be a key word, I think, of our discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I mean, yeoman's duty, everybody, this late in the conference. We will get a real discussion going here, but I thought it's always important to hear each panelist uh, just take a moment. And so I'm going to ask only this first question of each panelist in turn. I want to ask you this. I'll start at that end sure. uh, with Jenny. In a couple weeks, I just noticed the first half of 2016 runs out. We're almost at the halfway point. I know that's terrifying. So we only have about half of 2016 to get something important done or several important things done. From your point of view at the PAHO Foundation, the issues you see, what's something that you want to see done? A critical item on our agenda is to bring to the attention of not only this community here, but to ministers of health, ministers of finance, tourism, the idea that health is an investment and it is the platform on which sustainable development of communities, countries, and regions will be built. To that end, the foundation is convening a summit planfully to not end the year without achieving this because our goal is to articulate how that process can occur, beginning with strengthening health systems so we can have solid data. We all know the value of evidence-based data. We also know that if we have good systems in place, we're better able to predict and respond to emerging threats. We're also able to strategically invest in not only uh, uh, critical decisions around solutions and technologies, but we're able to transfer knowledge and leverage learnings in order to then uh, achieve critical goals in the future. Our decision is to ensure that 2017 is not a year in which we react to the newest health emergency. Mm, I think that's going to be a theme. Luke, you're going to send me an email on New Year's Eve, and you said you did it. So, but what is it? <laughs> well, it's interesting you ask if you did it. I don't think it's about me. It's about together. And, yes. and just to build on what Jenny said, I hope that by the end of 16, the world has moved from a reactive to a proactive mode. You know GSK is in the business of prevention with vaccines, so it's really preventing disease, devastating yes. diseases. And Ebola was a wake-up call to the world yes. because it, does, it was said by Jeremy, bugs don't stop at the frontier. And we've shown that we can do it, actually. We had yes. the pandemic flu yes. uh, in 2009. The world worked together, scrambled, yes. and yes. dealt with it. Uh, Ebola came, again, companies like J&J, &J, GSK, Merck, we worked together with WHO, with institutions and all of that to deal with it. But let's be honest, I, I mean, it's always reactive. So if we could move to proactive, we at GSK are committed to contribute what we're good at, which is innovation, the science, the technology platforms. But the globe needs to step up, and I hope we can see that. And hopefully we can discuss a bit about that. Yeah, I want to totally follow up on how we can become proactive, what structures some people envision. Dr. Damrong Chai, in Thailand. Um, by the way, I, you pointed out that you're wearing yellow. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's, that's significant. Well, David, you know, uh, our king, the Thai king, uh, uh, has been uh, king for 70 years already. And 70. today is the anniversary of his accession to the throne. Oh. 70th. Wow. He's 89. Uh, oh. 
Um, and the gold is symbolic of... of, of the, the yellow is his color. Yeah. And uh, by the way, he's also a, an inventor. He owns uh, 11 patents. And uh, he was trained as an engineer when he was young before Thailand got <coughs> another idea for him. So, um, okay, to your question. Yeah, so, so the agenda, now that we only have about a half year left. Half year, <laughs> but I'm sorry, David. Uh, my year in Thailand, we start from October last year. <laughs> oh, so either only, time is short or time is long. Only four <laughs> months, or oh, three months three to go. Months yeah. to go. <laughs> uh, I have two things in my mind. Uh, <clears throat> The first thing is my, in my role as uh, co-chair uh, of the APEC Life Science Innovation Forum, uh, we uh, set our clear agenda to go about uh, making the finance ministers and senior officials throughout the member economies understand the impact of uh, health, uh, of, of the, the, the health, fiscal impact of illness, ill health. And, and we're going to we have already assessed the, the scale of the impact and we try to find uh, innovative financial mechanism and uh, collaborative model to together work on it. That, that is one thing that I have in my mind. The second one is closer to my heart and it's a bit personal. You know, two or three years before, uh, Thailand was featured on, on Worldview yeah. uh, scorecard. We came at the bottom of the list. Was it that uh, which I'm not very proud of. Um, that was, I think, in Chicago. Then uh, I was uh, very upset. I called Jeremy, and I, you know, I complained about it uh, foolishly. That, you were being virulent at that point. I was virulent, <laughs> very foolishly. But uh, you know, at the at the end of the day, you have to work hard. So when we go back and, and work very hard, so this year uh, we have. Uh, came up with uh, a policy package proposing to the Thai government uh, to reform a lot of things, to move the country towards a bioeconomy and to set in motion certain mechanisms that would change Thailand, to change the environment, to become uh, a good global uh, value chain player. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping for the rest of the, it's only three months for me, so uh, the proposal is, is going to be submitted to the cabinet in a week or two. So I'm hoping for the best and I'm trying to work hard towards implementing uh, those policies during the rest of the, the year. Thank you. Dr. De Becker, so we've heard from GSK, PAHO, Thailand, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, time is of the essence on a lot of things that are on your plate. Well, give me a sense of one or more of your priorities for the year? Yes, yes, there's certainly a lot on our plate before the end of the year. Um, but I want to come back to a topic that Seema also touched upon, and it's about a dream we have, right? It's about a vision of creating a world without disease. And if you think about that for a moment, a world without disease, what that really means, um, obviously it's not something we can achieve by the end of the year, but if you Think about what you can do so as to prevent diseases, intercept diseases. We have done it in infectious diseases, as Luke was pointing out. We have been able also in infectious diseases to cure diseases. Hepatitis C now is a curable disease. So this vision of creating a world without disease, um, we believe in it very strongly. And we have launched a number of initiatives. One of them is a quick fire challenge where we really invite all of you and academics, entrepreneurs, everyone around the world to help us think about solutions that can achieve that, convergent solutions that go beyond just uh, pharmaceuticals, but can also move into consumer medical devices, uh, diagnostics. So I'm really excited to see what we will receive from that quick fire challenge, what will come in, what ideas will emerge, and we're looking forward to uh, putting a huge emphasis on helping to make that possible. If we were in Washington, D.C., I would insist on the honorific for all our panelists, but can I switch to first names? Yes. Is it Absolutely. all right? Yes. We're in sure. California. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jenny. <laughs> uh, give me a sense. I mean, Luke brought it up, but this notion of maybe structures yes. to reduce the reactiveness of the global public health system. Something that would be 
you know, early warning system or so, so we're, not, we're not reinventing the wheel each time, but if you have to ramp up to fight a new disease threat and you start on the day that it's identified as a disease threat, that puts you behind. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. So it is very important for us in the region, and, and uh, I, I say that with all due respect to the, the work that has gone on, uh, there's quite a bit of, of work. PAHO is known for its work and, and partnering with agencies not only to cure disease. In fact, within the World Health Organization system, PAHO is exemplary in its achievements. Uh, however, the challenges that we face today are more complex, and they are, they are challenges that, that emerge when you have convergence of various things. So you have basic practices, you have uh, belief systems, you have the uh, lack of availability to innovative medicines, and then the distance between economic and health. You know, when public health works, nobody knows about public health. When it fails, we have Zika and Ebola. In every headline. And, and, yeah. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes imperative that we take an ecological approach to understanding how data can be captured and how data should be framed in order to be captured. In the region, for us, it's important that the variables that are used can be harmonized. These are not difficult things. They're time-consuming things. But it also requires an investment by all stakeholders to recognize that if we have the data and if we are able to share the data, I respect intellectual property, I, and I respect the need for ownership and sovereignty, but to begin, we have to have a foundation in which we can look at information from all the different uh, communities and stakeholder interests, and then identify where should the spend be to best shore up and predict. Should we spend it in educating consumers to change practices, which will give rise to managing vector issues? Should we give rice, should we give training to the ministers to help the Minister of Health have a bigger stick at the table with the Minister of Finance? You know, where is that? And then how do we repurpose information and disseminate it through the region so that the region can see themselves accept ownership and, and, and as you mentioned, grow in the scorecard of recognition of being a competitive player. If we're able to do these things, then we have the basis for really having health efficiencies that work and innovation and solutions that are meaningful. Look, what are your thoughts about specific structures? It's not just about building a big factory that's ready to rock, ready to go on a new vaccine, uh, but what what could be set up to, to, to you know, move the whole response a year forward? Well, I mean, I, I think what, what Jenny just was saying is, is very important because it shows that what you are responsible for and where you are in the field, the data, the health policies, the healthcare workers, are they trained and all of that, that's an important part to combine in partnership with the expertise that a company like ours has since many, many years, which is inventing, discovering, yes. developing vaccines with, with proven track record. But it's, like you said, the fact we don't have factories waiting until Ebola comes. Right. Secondly, we know that there is a list of 70 pathogens, yes. known pathogens that That's potentially right. might hit next. I mean, it's up to the, to the globe, actually, to convene and say, what are the first pathogens likely, based upon data, that we should be working on? Right. And our commitment in, in, in GSK vaccines and is to constantly continue to invest in technology platforms that would enable that when the next Zika happens, that we can actually just, just start producing. Because we have not just developed vaccines 20 years ago, classical vaccines, basically, yes. in a classical method of producing, which takes a lot of time. I mean, it takes 10 years to just build one factory to make a vaccine. But we're investing now in technology platforms like 
have the SAM technology was being discussed here uh, at this conference. We have the vector technology that was used for, for Ebola. And 20 years ago, we already invested in adjuvant technology. Yeah. These are technologies that would allow that when something happens, we can react fast. Yes. But so we need data, we need priority setting. We need to do our job continuously investing in, in technology and innovation and then make sure we can manufacture it. And we need to work with the globe and the globe needs to work with us to yes. see how we will finance all of that. Yes. But I think we had enough noise now and we should not We've, we've spoken a lot about it since, uh, since Ebola happened. Since Ebola. And I think now we need to really get to an action plan and, and move forward. And we are committed to participate in that. I think the good news is that, I mean, since the Ebola crisis hit, um, if you look at what happened afterwards, I mean, it's a, it's a very complex situation. And everyone needed to enter in a lot of partnership, public, private, across companies, with governments. Um, so, we actually proved that that was really possible. I mean, six months after the uh, crisis hit, we had, you know, a lot of partnerships were in place. I mean, funding was in place. We had the trials ongoing. And obviously, it shows how, um, how quick and efficient we can be when a crisis hits. And obviously now you often get a response, well, all these companies, GSK, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, I mean, we put a lot of effort into developing um, a vaccine. I mean, we had 10 clinical trials ongoing. We obviously um, put a lot of finances against it. Um, but it is, as was also said, it, it's going to come again. You know, I mean, since 1976, there have been 24 or so Ebola outbreaks. I mean, this will not be the last one. Is it apparently so, a special right? challenge for you, too, because at the moment, you may not have enough human subjects to do the tests because it went into, you know, it's in this different phase. That is, that is correct. I think it's important to point out that all the work that has been done to come as far as we have come is not in vain, right? I mean, there is going to be this next crisis. We're going to be extremely well prepared for the next one. And it's also, I think, important to point out that when the crisis hit, we didn't have to start from scratch. We That's were right. already working yes. on Ebola vaccine. It would never have been possible to be in the clinic in such a short time frame if we had not been proactive and, to Luke's point, bring together the platforms you need. So I think there is certainly an opportunity on the industry side to look at all these you know, potential diseases and be very proactive on the R&D side, right? So when it hits, we're really prepared to go after it very, very But quickly. I think it should be a, a sustainable yeah. effort, meaning I, I was in January in, in uh, Guinea in, in one of those Ebola centers yes. when WHO declared it Ebola free. So met with uh, Ebola yes. survivors. And the funny thing is that once that was announced, all the it's, attention, everybody it's, it's pulled still, back from Guinea yes. Yeah. And, and that's where it, all the effort goes down. Yeah. And that should not happen again, actually, because right. that, that's where it goes wrong. Because we're very good in crisis modus. We're not good, the globe is not yet good to get organized, to have a constant effort. Right. Because that will make sure that we are moving from reactive to proactive. It's a constant effort. Like we continuously have to invest in innovation, otherwise we're out of business. We would not be able to run a sustainable business if we do not continue to innovate. I mean, that's the theme of this conference as well. If we don't uh, partner with, with, with the right partners in a, in a, in a so, good And I think, that, yeah. I, I think that this is a very important point because you continue to innovate in the academic, in the policy arena, that resource is not always available. Right. And the connection at that point with industry is often missing. And so it becomes imperative that we all consider health as an investment and shore up a system, an infrastructure, as you said, David. There needs to be some, for, the, for lack of a tired word, some center, some place that we can go. You talk about a minister of the future. Well, it, should there be a, a, a global tank, a global repository that harvests uh, best practices and learnings that becomes um, uh, a place where people can step in, render comments, work on some things, go back, we learn. 
Because if we do this, then we're ready to respond. Zika is demanding this. What we knew of Zika last October is vastly different than what we think we know today. So when you build compounds and solutions, is it really going to be responsive to Zika or Zika variant X? Well, it should be exactly. too many variants. That's exactly. why the platform technology is the most important, important piece so that you then Absolutely. can plug in whatever antigen. That it has and that is actually a topic yeah. that is relevant not just for these crises that happen in developing worlds, typically, right? Yes. I mean, the sharing of data and learning from data is, I think, a critical thing that we have a lot of it to improve on across yes. the globe, right? And yes. here in the United States as well. Jenny, you raised this issue, which is that you have to have um, developed local capabilities. Now, that's mm -hmm. very obvious when it comes to fighting an outbreak, mm -hmm. where you saw in some parts of West Africa, where the health right. systems were uh, already in a weakened form when this happened. But I think also implicit in your comment must be something about if, you, uh, if the local health systems and the local research capabilities and the smartest people s stay in an individual country, they could be at the leading edge of the response Absolutely. with their special, what, special knowledge Absolutely. of their own country, obviously, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It truly becomes an early warning system. But it's an early warning system that allows for the development of relevant and culturally appropriate responses. Because oftentimes there's a tension between the transfer from the developed to the developing that is perceived in terms of value. Mm -hmm. And if that tension persists, then it slows down the opportunity to really deliver effective solutions. Having an harmony between capacity in the country to not only track, monitor, and report, but to, la to, to collaborate and engage and to discuss and offer um, uh, differing opinions and then refine for the best, it serves the world. You know, Zika started in Africa. It is now here. And, and, and you, you've seen the, the, the huge confluence of challenges around that from every possible ministry. Well, in the US, there's a lot of concern about it because we're entering summer. But what have we learned from the summer of experience in the other regions? Mm -hmm. And how do we really move quickly when detection and final arbitration on diagnosis is in one country or two countries? I'm, I'm positive I think we can get there because we we have a great example. If we look at the uh, malaria vaccine development that we've done together with many, many partners, yes. that started 30 years ago, and it was with ups and downs, but sustainably the partners stayed on track to do it. And, and it's, it's an intervention. It's not the complete answer, right. uh, but it shows that we can do it. And I think we should look into those examples where every partner brought his or her uh, capacity and complementarity actually to, yes. to the whole table. It can be done, so I'm, I'm positive that it can be done. But wh what we should not do is wait until there is a consensus nice. and everybody right. agrees, right. because then it, it won't happen it's either. Automatically we should just get, get too on late. Yes. Naris, I want to ask you, I mean, the work that Thailand is doing to essentially move itself up in the scorecard, but really to nurture that innovative industry, that applies to, the, in other words, that's about economic development, clearly, but also it would put Thailand in this stronger position that uh, Jenny and Luke are talking about. When, if, God forbid, something happens, you would have um, a, a stronger public health system, stronger coterie of researchers to understand how it should be dealt with in your region. Yeah, um, with a population of <clears throat> 76 uh, sorry, 67 million, mm -hmm. uh, GDP about uh, 6,000 per head. We are uh, around the middle. Uh, we say Thailand is a middle income trap, <clears throat> okay, as many other countries. So uh, right now, uh, we are thinking of how we could move uh, forward and get out of the trap. And one thing that we need is to retain 
uh, talent uh, within the country, uh, as Jenny said. Uh, when something happens, we need the local capability. We already have a quite good health sy system. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, we started the universal health coverage. So it is so called uh, $1 cure all diseases. So it's a bit easy to understand. So you pay only $1 per hospital visit, and no matter what you are, uh, you will be taken care of. And uh, for the drugs that are on the national drug list, it will be updated every year. So you know, more, the more uh, need, uh, like uh, dialysis, uh, those will be added to the list. <clears throat> so uh, for the local capabilities, uh, we believe that we have many well-trained scientists, uh, most of them in the United States. <laughs> Going back to the King story, uh, the King's father, Actually, he was trained as a military man, but then he saw the situation, the healthcare situation at home. He decided to become a medical doctor, so he went to study at Harvard University. That was wait, wait, it's where is that? It's in Massachusetts. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, he he finished his medical study, and uh, uh, the, the the current king was born actually in Massachusetts. Mm. And uh, he was influenced by, by his father. The whole country uh, benefited because he came back to Thailand uh, and uh, he did not become king. He established the foundation of modern medicine in Thailand. And that is why we are where we are right now, becoming the global spot for medical tourism, having more than 53 JCI hospitals in Thailand, very good hospital systems and uh, a good healthcare system like where universal coverage. Okay, so to go, the next step is how we deal with innovation. We need to retain people, and the good news is that uh, in the World View Report, it also says Thailand is still one uh, in the top three countries where we, we, uh, we're the top on the list when it comes to retain talents at home. Now, <clears throat> most of the talents, when they study, they come back, they come to work in the universities or public research institutes because the industry is still nascent, uh, you know, no, not many jobs to do. Um, but with more and more uh, healthcare situation, com companies like J&J, &J, GSK come to Thailand, they may want to set up R&D. So the government decided to unlock these talents so that they don't have to, they still have to pay back by working, uh, you know, they get scholarships, okay? Yes. They come back, they pay back by working. Uh, those talents are now unlocked to be able to work for private companies, local or international. So we call it talent mobility program. There's also brain drain program. We bring back those brains to, to at home so, so we can work. And those people would be excellent uh, connector or, or translator, yes. so the bridge, the gap that we have right. between developed and developing countries. But this, this local empowerment, I think, is, is really critical. Um, so one of the initiatives we took was in South Africa. I notice it's number 35 on the list. So, uh, But in South Africa, we partner with um, university to train people on R&D, and they were they are going to work on uh, tuberculosis and malaria, things that are really relevant for the local community, right? And then we are teaming up with 19 um, hospitals to work on HIV because it's still a big, big issue. But it's all about not us coming there and doing things, but empowering the local people so that they can do the research that is necessary, <laughs> that they know how to take care, that they get access to technology, um, and really leave something behind to the whole point of sustainability, right? That makes the local system stronger to, to deal with. I think this is issues. a very important yeah. question. The idea of strengthening, as part of strengthening the system, strengthening the human resource capacity. Right. Yeah. You know, country, countries grow out of a cure model based on historical experiences and deficit, you know, polio and all of these things. But now we have. We're in a, a new age where everybody has a cell phone. Right. Everybody has access to some sort of technology. And you can vet information from the most respected source. 
And, and there needs to be a way to have uh, improved communication, improved capacity, improved awareness, and, and to sort of moderate that, that dialogue, but also to engage the leaders that make policy. Mm -hmm. So they understand the, how, how, how the policies affect not only the country's efficiencies, but also health, and then the spend that is made. Every country has to make a commitment on some spend as part of the GDP and its growth. In the absence of good information, in the absence of human resource strengthening, the spend is made in a vacuum, which results then in poor response. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yeah. I was, um, it turns out that Bill Gates, his favorite line from the movie The Martian with Matt Damon mm -hmm. is probably your favorite line, right? He's going to science the science the crap out of the problem. Um, and you know, that's a key part of innovation, but so is policying the crap out of the problem. Yeah. Talk a little bit um, about the policy foundations that we're going to need for these partnerships. Actually, I just remember what the GSK boss, the CEO, he had a nice rhetorical flourish when he spoke about it on our show. He said, um, to do the work in peacetime mm -hmm. that will be necessary for when yes. the war, the yes. new disease threat comes. What, are, what, what do we need to see at the policy level to move this stuff forward? Any thoughts about priorities? Well, absolutely. Um, uh, in, in, in the region, when I say the region, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, even though PAHO Foundation's remit is from Canada to Chile, uh, we focus, you know, south of the USA. I think it is very important to have policymakers understand how policies are created that have broad and far-reaching implications. But we have to do it understanding the dynamic nature of the presence of policymakers. You know, I, I, I think that, uh, and I'm from Barbados, so I'm speaking also with that hat on my head. Um, recognizing that, um, there, you know, when you look north, you want everything that is in America or in Europe. But there's not a good understanding of what it takes to have it. And, and so policies are made with an intention for investment that may actually give rise to burden in other areas and may co be costly in other areas. And so there's tension that, that occurs. Robbing Peter to pay Paul kind Absolutely. of and, and in our region, the policies are often a trade-off and a win-lose. It's not a win-win. You know, in the US, we talked about taking money from the policymakers said, let's take money from Ebola to address Zika. Well, there's, that, that may be a win-win in the US. But there, uh, you may have now the presence and the growth of syphilis because you're spending money on Zika. Mm -hmm. so, so to think about policies, we need to have, I, I keep going back to this, sort of repository that allows us to not only harvest information, but if you have this, you're able to test models, and out of that comes guidelines that are solid, that are evidence-based, that can be shared, and ground policy. Yeah. So you go top down, bottom up. Yeah. So it seems to me that there's an obligation by all of us who care about the health of the planet, people to begin to have this sort of dialogue and not dialogue that is siloed only around discovery or medicines or health or what, but it has to be cross-sectional. And we have to figure out how we knock on the door and bring others to the table so that the policies are meaningful and relevant. I'd like to comment on this because I think uh, it's a great point what also the president said at the introduction, which is finance ministers, health ministers, yes. is, it's, they, they have to work together. Mm -hmm. But I think great partnerships and collaborations on, at, at global level are also based upon trust. And I want to explain yes. what I mean with that is sometimes countries, and you said it, uh, Jenny, they want to copy what's in the US or what is in Europe. And that's exactly what should not happen, exactly. meaning that um, if everybody wants his or her own regulatory um, system, yes. 
that will just make things more difficult. Yes. Why can't we use the reference FDA, European yes. Medicines Agents? I mean, the WHO pre-qualification is a great example of that as well. Yeah. Just keep on referring to that, but spend the money on, like you were explaining, on, on frontline workers, That's education, right. making sure that um, when, when they have to deal with, with a problem, they know how to deal. And, and that's, limit yourself to what is really making a difference on the ground where you are, rather than trying to copy the same thing. Yeah. We are very much confronted with that because every single country would like to have a vaccines factory on their soil yes. or have a research center on their yes. soil. I yes. think in, a, in, a, in the flat world that was mentioned by Jeremy, I mean, that should not be the ambition. The ambition That's should right. be to offer healthcare at That's the same right. level right. across the world, mm. wherever you live. But I think we have an obligation to have the dialogue so learning can occur. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we fail when we do not have the dialogue, but we, 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 um, we, 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 we may criticize instead of having the dialogue and having, having the countries understand. You know, there's, there's pride in sovereignty. Sure. There's pride in ownership. And I, as individuals, we seek to own and we seek to possess and we seek to find value in the reflection that we build. But at some point, we, we've now become this global world where Zika does not take the passport, but it comes, or Ebola, or, or Dengue, or in, or, and there are many others that will come. So the dialogue must now occur that says the time has come for us to say, what are the best? How do we leapfrog and how do we strengthen and then ensure universal access? Hmm? We're here, like really it's like ground zero for the, uh, the American style of silicon-based technical innovation. And you mentioned, uh, Jenny, that uh, you know, people often in, in your more southern countries under your remit, look north. Yes. Uh, but are there things that are worth borrowing here that, uh, that this tech industry here um, could help inform some of the problems that we are uh, addressing? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, at the PAHO Foundation, we're talking to Silicon Valley about the idea of this open source model. What does that mean? How, how can that be applied in the health community? How can we take the best brains? We talked about that with Ebola. Certainly, with river blindness, we've done that. We brought many people together, industry, governments, and, and we eradicated just about. With many other things as well. So I think that there is something to be learned, and, and maybe the framework can exist from here, but the content and the population can come from the region so that what comes out of it is relevant and appropriate with the right spend, the right investment, and then the right ownership. Marianne, uh, open yeah. source, but not <laughs> open source. <laughs> right, <laughs> From right. industry's point of view. Well, yeah, I was just gonna say, it, it, it is offering an amazing opportunity though, because I don't know, there are probably six, 6 6.8 or 7 billion mobile phones yes, in the world. Absolutely. So there is this amazing platform yes. that a lot of people in the developing countries have access to. And apps are cheap yes. and knowledge can really be distributed well, right? Yes. And there's all these devices now that you can plug to your mobile phone that really allow you to do critical healthcare um, things, right? I yes. mean, you can use it absolutely. to screen for a cancer absolutely. lesion, you can use it to uh, do an echography, you can get your electrocardiogram right. on your Absolutely. iPhone, measure glucose. There's so many opportunities to contribute through that platform uh, in the developing world and give people more empowerment about yes. their own health. They can really, you know, measure and, and, and diagnosticize some of their own, their own um, their measurements and be much more educated, right? So I think that on itself, um, I mean, a lot of these apps, a lot of these technologies are being created here in the United mm -hmm. States. And I think it is a huge opportunity for developing countries to capitalize. Uh, but imagine that. then that data, imagine aggregating the data based on people's searches and, and predicting funds. where right. to best invest in solution or compounds to treat 
or to improve diagnostic technology. That's the innovation that comes from being in this and opening the door and sharing and exploring. And that's actually a global need, right? Because this Absolutely. is big data and deep learning and we haven't really gotten yes. so far as to under, first of all, agree that we need to bring all the data together, but yes. then also to have the algorithms to really Absolutely. get the insights yeah. from it. Absolutely. Right? That's so, a great point. We should yeah. not keep on making that divide between yeah, developed and developing yeah, world. Fine. I mean, it's a, it's a global health it's yes. a cross issue and, yes. and the big data, as you mentioned. Yeah. Naras, do you have some feelings yeah. about that? Yeah, we recently organized a big event in Bangkok called Startup Thailand, where young people, I haven't seen so many young people gathering in one place. It's just not a concert hall. Um, uh, people came, I was in charge of the health sector, health tech. Uh, these young guys come with their own companies and you were asking about the North American style, uh, Silicon Valley, okay? Uh, for the first time it happened in Bangkok. And uh, you know, those new ideas come with, the, the things that you mentioned about the sh uh, resource sharing, who gets what, the, 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 the best match, which is uh, relatively easy and, and doesn't take a lot of money to do, but it takes you know thinking and a, a good business model. So we try to help these companies to grow up and and, and link with uh, their friends in Massachusetts or in San Francisco and and grow and to get to them to realize the global problem that they could participate uh, and and help to solve. So this just started. Uh, we call it the, the the new startup program. And you were asking about the policy. So this became. The, this government policy of nurturing young people with ambition to, 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 to have their own company, we may still have to educate them about the risk. They, sure. they, they're not like people here. They, you grow up with the risk-taking culture. Yes. It's a bit different back home where I come from. So that part is, is a bit tricky. But if we get uh, over that, <coughs> uh, we expect to see uh, uh, the, the blossom of, of new uh, company, company by young generations. And by the way, uh, we have, uh, I got to know a young Thai scientist who is now the chief scientific officer of a startup company in, 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 in New York. Uh, his company is called uh, 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 Epibone. They grow, uh, they take cells from the patient's uh, uh, tissue and they grow it uh, uh, and they use a scaffold. 3D uh, CT scan data, make it to scaffold and grow bone cells and make it into uh, mm. mature uh, tissue uh, and with bones and put back into the body. So, so this, uh, this is just one example of uh, our brain, uh, which are located here, and we may have to transplant them back home or use him as a model to, to uh, millions of our young people that here is an opportunity yeah, you, you, can, you can follow your dream if you get to the right uh, problem of the world to solve it. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite topics is, is entrepreneurship and uh, variants of tolerance for risk in different yes. countries. I, I've often remarked that in some countries, um, if you fail at a business, you can't get married yeah. because that the, your in-laws will not accept a loser. Yeah. And uh, you know it's, it's that's true, the though. fundamental thing here <laughs> in this part of California and lots of parts around the U.S. There's so many things you don't want to copy, um, but there may be that's a, that's like this special thing because in an industry that you have, where the risks are very high and there's going to be a lot of failure. Um, the culture that supports that is important. Yes, I, I must say I was amazed until less than a year ago I still lived in Europe, right? And I moved here to the West Coast. And if you look at the risk on itself of innovation, um, Scott Birkin in his book about the myths of innovation has looked at all the challenges that innovation has and came up that you have probably 0.4% chance of overcoming them. And if you overlay that with the risk, just the technical and regulatory mm -hmm. risk in our industry, mm -hmm. you have to be crazy, right, to, to do it. <laughs> but if you come here, everyone is willing to take that risk, right, That's because right. this is bigger goal that you want to achieve. Now, however, in, in Belgium and Europe, and Luke and myself were talking about that earlier, that risk-taking mentality is certainly 
not there as much. And, and people are really afraid of failure. If you fail to your point, you're not in a good spot. Mm -hmm. While here, the first thing my kids learn in school is failure is good. You learn from it, right? And you will not make that mistake again. Yeah. And I think indeed these cultural differences, I mean, to the point of entrepreneurship and innovation, I mean, they are there, right? And you have to somehow over, overcome them. I'm getting so inspired here. I'm going to run out of here when we're done and go out and fail. <laughs> um, we have two lovely microphones here. Give me a hand. Uh, uh, I'm sure you have some burning questions of this panel. Go up to the mic. Uh, just give us a sense of your, get, uh, tell us your name and fire away, please. Uh, Bruce Jeanette and um, the great discussion. So one of the benefits of the tech revolution has been the empowerment of patients uh, the patient will see you now, the availability of healthcare information and medical information to patients. And that's led to something which I'm not the first to observe, but a focus in this country on what it really means economically to a country to have a culture of wellness rather than a culture of sickness. The cost of sickness is X. The impact economically back into a country of a culture of wellness is hugely, you know, geometrically better. So I just wonder if that's kind of developing. I don't think it's going to stop. Do you see that outside the U.S. as a kind of a governmental or societal focus? Maybe we should focus on wellness and not sickness? Well, so, wellness and even uh, to, to, to move your, your uh, question even forward further, measuring wellness so then it can yes. be compared against health care costs. Yeah. We'd like to take that on. So within, within the region, um, you know, there's a continuum of life and, and, and you know, you there are interruptions and places, you know, peaks and valleys along the way. And, and so within some of the culture, the whole idea of, um, uh, you know, even um, uh, care, the, the convalescent care and that sort of thing, the systems are not there to support that. On the front end, the idea of advocacy that gives rise to wellness is not also very strong. So, so these are cult, and, and, and they're buffeted by religion and different things. I, one of the things the Paho Foundation recognizes in the need for a culture of wellness as a best predictor of sustainable outcomes and, and sustainability for the country is to begin to strengthen the ministry's capacity to, to endorse this culture because it must come from there as well as from the bottom up. People, people do have complaints and they'll raise questions, but once they're addressed, it goes away. And it needs to be a groundswell, but there needs to be a legitimate approval, if you will, and a legitimate support. And part of it must come from the ministry uh, and so, there's work to be done. We need help to, to make this happen. I think there's an educational effort to be yeah. made as well, because obviously uh, I will not be selfish, but uh, with GSK vaccines, we're into prevention since, since many, many years. And it's clearly that vaccination is the first step to then care about your wellness and all of that, because if right. you don't have a vaccination against the, the, the basic diseases, then. But I think there's a component of own responsibility that mm -hmm. should be educated okay, to, to people right. because if you think about vaccination, childhood vaccination, rightly so, is taken care of by government, by yes. Ministry of Health and all mm -hmm. of that. But we see now that actually across the lifespan there are vaccines available. That's right. And I don't think that a healthcare sh system should pay for the whole the lifespan, whole That's right. but that actually own responsibility become, comes into play. And a great place to educate on that is wellness because people want to have this Fitbit and want to be, you know, in, in good shape. And that's why you can start that own the responsibility. The patients should have a little bit more skin in the game on, yes. on, 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 on uh, uh, seizing uh, things that yeah. can bring wellness Well, I wouldn't call them patients because hopefully you never become a oh, patient. Oh, yeah, wrong yeah. word. Like Marianne yeah. said. Exactly. You know, it's about people. It's, no, I take that point. Taking care Prevent of their, yes. as a responsibility or health like we do for the planet, you know. We, we, I think we've moved on. We still have a, a way to go, but you know, the, the carbon footprint and so on. Yeah. So I think yeah. also health is an own responsibility, and wellness can respond to that. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I think we in the uh, in the East may not be as indiv individualistic as uh, our friends in the in the West. Uh, when we think of wellness, we don't think of 
uh, individual wellness that much when yeah. you think of society or, or right. family or yeah. so uh, we, we talked about uh, infectious disease and vaccines uh, a lot today but we haven't talked about the aging society that much uh, yes. in, in my country uh, we're aging very fast and we have programs to educate people with Alzheimer or rather people who take care of elderly people yeah. with Caregivers, Alzheimer yeah. it's a big big issue and it, it, it's an issue of wellness and how you keep your mental health uh, sound when you have to look after you know people with difficult to handle so we are going to face more and more of those things so this is one issue that we have better prepared now and our solution is not again individualistic but to to educate or to have people to learn about how to be uh, live well together. Yeah. Yeah. And employers can do a lot to, to that regard, right? I mean, Johnson & Johnson is a huge emphasis actually on, on programs that focus on wellness um, yeah. with our Human Performance Institute. Um, so it, it's really recognized as something that creates value for the organization. Indeed. Sir, tell us your name. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff Comprikos with Merck. And um, first of all, I have to say, uh, Mr. Neris, uh, we're delighted to uh, see Thailand moving up in the rankings. I think there are a lot of us in the industry believe that uh, Thailand has a tr tremendous uh, potential in the sector. And, um, you know, it's kind of a natural top 30 country. And, I, you know, whatever we can do to help you get there, I think a lot of people in this room want to partner with you on that. My question is also to um, uh, Dr. Jenny, because, um, uh, you know, I know PAHO, the PAHO Foundation, as reconstituted, revitalized, you have a new mission. And I, you know, I, you must have your top three uh, 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 objectives this year. I'd, I'd guess that Zika would be um, at the top. But I wonder, is there space in there to facilitate a conversation around boosting this sector's competitiveness in Latin America? Latin America has a lot of potential, too. And, is there a way to bring the policymakers to, together, maybe through the PAHO Foundation, to talk about what those good policies would look like, how we could do more innovation, investment in Latin America? Thanks. I think that's an excellent um, request. Uh, PAHO Foundation sits at the nexus between industry and the policymakers. Our preferred partner of support is PAHO, who sits in the office of the ministry. We have a unique and a long successful relationship of building capacity through PAHO in the region. And, and so a couple of years ago, we recognized that things are changing. There was dialogue on state, non-state actor uh, engagement and FENSA and you know, on and on and on. And we recognized that there, there's a need to help strengthen the capacity in the region to be responsive and be strategic about the investment in health. And so one of the things that, that we've committed to doing is to bring in this dialogue into the region and to foster in uh, engagement and discussions across the group. When Zika broke this year, we were in the middle of, or, or last year for us, we were in the middle of really gearing up around antimicrobial resistance. You know, WHO demands that each country must develop country plans. That, that is actually the big bugaboo nice. that we should be thinking about. Nice. But Zika came, and you see the face of a baby, and a baby or an animal, you have to respond. So for us, we convened with the ministers of tourism. Because for us, we understood that if you speak about Zika in a region where tourists is 20, 30 percent of the gross revenue, you could kill a country and you could limit their ability then to really survive and return. The Olympics is showing us this. So what we are doing and what we plan to do is have many more of these conversations and figure out how to leverage technology in order to not only address at the top, but address at the bottom. And we are looking for and inviting partners to support us in this agenda to have this global platform that allow us to leapfrog and allow policies then to be relevant, 
but borrowing from those who have done and developed and implemented and so that what is created then is sustainable, but it can share. And, and we hope that in doing that, we can help to increase then the competitiveness of the region. There's political will like there's never been. Mm -hmm. I have to say that. How to do it and with whom can this be done? Those are the big questions. And so we're committed to working with anyone or group that is interested in order to address in this issue. But just a slightly mm -hmm. different nuance, but I, I probably as a follow-up to that last question, it may be our last question. When you look at the Worldview Scorecard, I'm mm -hmm. sure you're going to later, or already have, mm -hmm. checked your countries. Absolutely. And then is there anything you could do, um, or would you even see it as your role, to, to have a discussion about how some of those countries could move up the rank? Absolutely. In fact, Within a couple of weeks, we'll be in Mexico. And we're purposefully meeting with the academic community, research hubs. We're meeting with the ministry, and we're meeting with foundations. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to understand and help Mexico understand the value that it has as a model for the region. Here, we're not looking to the north. We're looking then across, Within. out and across. So how do we leverage this? and move forward. The next step is to bring industry to the table. And with that then, there, these, these are very tangible, practical steps that will help influence the competitiveness. And Mexico, Mexico then can become a very clear beacon of how to, and, and, and hopefully then an opportunity to grow uh, within this field. Okay, with the knowledge that there's a, a party that's about to happen through yes. these doors, as soon as we're done, any final thoughts? A little, anything else you want to emphasize with this? Look at this audience that uh, that uh, talk about um, adhering to their uh, prescriptions. They have just stayed here with us. Any any final things that we didn't? Uh... I just love those ideas. Um, I think it's once you have a strong research and R&D base in a country. A strong academic center, you can really, you know, build the rest around it. Um, and, you know, we have these incubators for small yes. companies, yes. right? We just opened a new one in Houston and Toronto, yes. um, and one in Europe, a bit different, G Links in, in yes. Belgium. But I think if you could open some of these incubators around strong academic centers in those countries, that maybe could be a jump start to something. Join us. Something new, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope that we can do our NTL resolution, meaning that we can move right, we from can talking move. about things to, <laughs> to, do it. to the to real do action. It. Do it. You can, one can count on GSK that we will yeah. participate in Thank that. You. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I was inspired by when, when Jenny said about uh, it's a win-lose situation when it comes to policy. Yes. Uh, I really understand that because the same thing going on in my country so far. But uh, let's say when coming to bio, it's like coming to an Olympics. You know, you have yes. to prepare in advance. You have you need to have stamina, <laughs> running around all the time, That's and you know, keeping very busy. But but at the end of the day, it, it's not a win lose situation at all. I can feel that everybody got something to win and take That's home. Right. Yeah. So if you expand the the thinking from from really a domestic focus to yes. international, there's a lot of room. Uh, of possibility that you could ex exchange and, and, and match and you know help to do the things that is impossible at home could be possible at the bigger at the global level and that is my last word. What Thank a you. flawless way to end yeah. the last session of the conference, right? Um, I started by talking about Kurt Vonnegut and the Secretary of the Future. He once wrote this line, quote, to whom it may concern, it is springtime. It is late afternoon, close quote. Get it? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>Just one more thing, I, I forgot to mention, uh, uh, just one thank you I forgot to make earlier. I want to thank Joe DeMond, Senior VP, International Affairs for Bio, who has championed Worldview from, from its early days. So thank you and your team, always making this happen, and we're throwing a big party outside, right? So thanks, everyone, for staying with us, and have a great bon voyage. Right?
Brindo por 